Uh-oh, it looks like we piqued your interest in the hideout. First of all, let me tell you what the hideout is not. The hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business, strategic partnerships, and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever need them. This is not your typical mastermind. The hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything, joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, you'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, where attitude is everything. As I was watching that video, I was going like this. I was doing that over and over and over again because the guy who helps me with all of this and makes sure that my messaging is on point, I get to have on the show today. This man is a mindset marketer, but I, I, I mean, I know that's the, the moniker, but I want you to understand that when you get to spend time with him behind the scenes, when you get a chance to spend time with him as a person, he lives his message. And there's very few people in the world that do this. We have so many things in common. In, in, uh, I think the biggest thing is loving our family at the highest level. But this guy is an example in, in life, in, as a husband, as a father, as a businessman, as a hairdresser, and now as a marketer. This guy is on another level. He's the man behind the scenes of every single person out there that looks really good. This guy is sitting back very calm, very humble, encouraging people, pumping people up, and never putting the spotlight on him. He's making sure that everyone puts the spotlight where it needs to be. And I just, I am so honored to have Mr. Peter Anthony uh, joining me on the show today. Welcome, my brother. Welcome to you, brother. You look sexy. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. Bam. Hey, I, 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 got a, I got a new shirt. I got a new shirt today. I'm representing the golden age of hip hop <laughs> tribe called quest baby what you know about that peter oh you don't want to know man. you don't want to go there man <laughs> i was a dj for 13 years man that, there we go crazy crazy hey, hey that's that's that new york that, that, that new york flavor that new york yeah. flavor that you got i could hear it you talk about djing for how long 13 years man 13 at years level. at the Big highest club. level where at Big what clubs in uh, new york um, the Oak Beach Inn, um, which was the biggest, actually, even though the other names were bigger, uh, did a gig at the Hippodrome in London, did um, Studio 54, Limelight, um, just a ton of really cool clubs. Um, yeah, it was it was fun. But, you know, that was the 1980s. Mo most of my, you know, most of my colleagues were were kids running around in diapers in the 80s. <laughs> Hanging out tunes. It was fun though, but that's where you learn to market. That's where you learn strategies. Because when you're sitting there and you're and your job is to make people have fun, your job is to keep them engaged. Your job um, security is how fast you can do that, and and you know just really understanding and driving that culture through music. And then you know you and I have a similar story in the salon industry, where then I just took that that education, um, which I never thought was my education, you know, because I went to law school and did the whole law program, thought I was going to be an attorney. And then I met Tony and, you know, Tony Robbins just 
kind of messes with your mind. He did that mind thing to me, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, like I'm, I'm, you know, and so I, I worked my way through college as a disc jockey and a couple of other odds and ends, but I didn't, you know, so it was my first entre entrepreneurial endeavor. And then I had, you know, we started doing weddings and I had a big entertainment company. And then I, you know, I transitioned into the salons, but it was all about marketing, man. If you could make people happy, if you could put joy into their lives, just like you're doing, your marketing grows, right? Your messaging grows. The people want to do business with you because they get something they can't get from anybody else. So, Peter, one of the things that I that I noticed about you in spending time, and again, I get to spend time behind the scenes because I told this guy I was going to force him to be my friend for the rest of his life. And he was he laughed at he laughed at it, and he's like, you know, but he didn't know that I was going to be knocking at the door. I, I'm coming, man. I'm coming for you. I'm coming for that friendship. But now we're speaking on the same stages. Well, and and help me to understand this, man. I mean, is this something that that scrappy? You know, I, I that's the word that came to my head right when you started talking about DJing and then the hairdressing, and then you you noted you just said Tony, and then and then you elaborated with Tony Robbins, one of the biggest names in the uh, personal development industry. I mean, he created his own industry basically. But right. when talk to us about that scrap that you learned, is that something that you can learn? Is it something that's inside of you, or is it something that people can cultivate as they move along? You know, that's an interesting question because everybody asks that same question. It's like how how do I build out on the it factor. So the first thing, you know, when I was coaching Les Brown, we were redoing some of his products. It was about, you know, Les's message is about you got to be hungry. You become scrappy because you're hungry. Mm. And when you're hungry, everything happens. So first, you got to tap into what makes you hungry. And what do you really want? And what are you willing to do for that? You know, so in my life, it's, you know, faith, you know, I, you know, I'm willing to do anything for my faith, then it comes family, I'm willing to do anything for my family, and then the finances and the fun and all of those things fall into place, because I get that right. But you got to want it, and you have to want it badly. And you know, when you grow up in Brooklyn, New York, and on Long Island, you, you un there's millions and millions of people you're competing with. Especially, you know, like I graduated with 3,000 people in my graduating class, Kelly. 10,000 people in my school. That's, that's just, I mean, you can't wrap your head around a high school that has 10,000 students. My, my, it was bigger than my college. So you're in the position where you can really take it to the next level. And, but you have to figure out how your voice gets heard or your voice gets lost and i just you know i wanted to be heard i was a nerdy kid and i just but i was hungry i wanted i wanted to make something of myself and i knew you know if you don't do the work you don't get the results you know so i was willing to do what other people were not willing to do so that i could have what other people could never have and i just do the work every day i don't know if that answers your question well, it absolutely does. So uh, take us to this too. I mean, my, like I always love to understand the, the, the building, the foundation part of it. Take us to mom and pop, right? Because I mean, were they creating the hunger in you? Was it a, a situation where, you know, there's, there's some parents that uh, say, Hey, I'm going to have my kids and uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to work no matter what, even if we've got the money to be able to get it where they're going to work. Or sometimes the parents just don't have anything. We, uh, we, we both have a friend, a good friend of yours, Jeff, that has mastered this and has taken and made sure that even though his wealth is there, his kids are still performing at the highest levels. Talk oh, yeah. to us about your mom and pops and some of the lessons that they taught little Peter as he was coming along. I don't think you were ever a dork or a, a, a nerd or whatever you said that you were either. I, I, You've I always been cool, man. No, I have not. I was not cool. It's, a, it's an interesting question because there's two dynamics to it. And I was talking about that with Jeff last night. Um, my background, Kelly, is, um, you know, I was adopted my father, my natural father gave me up for adoption um, when I was 10, but I didn't see him from the time I was four. I was kidnapped from Peru. Um, I was an American citizen born here. Then my mother married a Peruvian citizen and 
their patriarchal society gave you dual citizenship. But without the father's signature, I was not allowed to leave the country, even though I was a U.S. citizen, nor was my brother. So um, he left us there. So we we literally, my mother didn't speak the language. She um, And I remember this one day, so this is what gave me the hunger. We were sitting on, we, we were on playing on a concrete slab and we had no food. My brother developed rickets. Um, we literally, we were starving. We would get like one small meal to share between the three of us a day. And, and, um, my brother sat on a banana and that was, that was the lunch that we were going to share. And when you sit on a banana, he was only, you know, two or three years old. And this is my first memory. He sat on the banana and my mom started just wailing, crying, like you cut her heart out. And she, I remember my mom trying to pick the banana up and pull the little pebbles off the concrete and try to figure out how we could still eat that banana. And I knew the one thing that I never wanted to be was hungry in the physical sense of food. And I never wanted anybody to go hungry. Um, so I've just made that decision. So I wish there, there was some really sexy... You know, um, you know, my dad was just this great mentor. My stepfather was massively abusive. My mom was a little shot. You know, I got adopted. Um, so I and that drove me to my faith. So my allegories and my wisdom comes from, you know, for, for some people, this might be cool. Some people it might not be. But I read the Bible a lot. I almost read it daily. And, and, and I. I extrapolate the wisdom from that. And then I read thousands of books trying to find wisdom. So I would read hundreds of autobiographies a year, learning from the people who I wanted to become because I didn't have access to those people. So I've found virtual access. And the most important thing you can do is not allow your surroundings to define you. Some people are like your pops master, unbelievably cool, raised incredible children. My friend Jeff raised incredible children. So now I'm in dad's school because I have four of my own children and I'm trying to make sure that I figure out how to, how to share that wisdom with my children and still keep them hungry. But my background um, was nothing short of, of quite literally welfare. We, when we got back to the United States, we were on welfare for two years and you know, my mom, we lived in a basement, in a one-room basement apartment, and my mom would sew scraps and try to take little scraps of um, of the lace and sew them on towels and try to sell the towels. She'd get the towels from the Goodwill store, sew lace on them, and then try to sell them as towel sets on the, in, on the literally on the street um, to try to put food on her table. So it was um, a definitely a tough upbringing. And then it didn't get easier through through grammar school and high school because of um, we had very staunch religious beliefs and that kind of segregated us. And I was quite picked on quite a bit. So, but I always knew, you know, um, America's land of opportunity. That's, I've, I heard that from a teacher. I believed it. And I said, if, if there is an American dream, like well, maybe I could dream it. Maybe I could be a business owner. What if I could do that? And then I started that journey of hunger and I, you know, got my first job at 11. I had five paper routes and then I had seven kids who deliver them. And then have them every day I was handing out money once a week and, and I owned the routes. So, you know, so it was entrepreneurial and I was a boss at 11, um, you know, go figure. And then, and then I would, then I did my entertainment company following that at a lawn mowing, you know, yard service that I actually, this is a cool story, Kelly. I'm going to share a story with you. I, I sold that. I had 25, 20 or 25 uh, accounts, right, in high school. And I knew that I was going into um, 11th grade. And, I, and, and at, in, in 11th grade, I said, I really got to kick butt my senior year because I'm graduating early and I'm going to college. And I, I just, I, I, I didn't want to do lawns that summer. So I sold that group of lawns and you never know what you do how it impacts somebody else i sold those 25 clients to a friend for i mean maybe for a thousand bucks 
right? So, some 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 return on my investment, a bunch of shovels and stuff. And he had a pickup truck. And I saw him at a high school reunion about 10 years later, and he thanked me. And he owned the biggest land um, landscaping service. And he said he still had like five or six of those original clients. Wow. That's cool, right? So, so Peter, talk to me too about this. I want to go to two places that you were talking about. Number one is I want to go to the abuse side, right? Because there's not a lot of time. I mean, obviously it's not a, a, a sexy, it's not, it, it's not a sexy, uh, you know, it's not like, um, that's a, a sexy topic, but, but it's something that has been in, in my family. It's been around with my friends, my cousins, my dad, my mom, you know, the, all these things. But a lot of times people aren't talking about it. And so what I want to talk about is what message do you want to send to all those kids that are maybe in the abuse right now that maybe that, you know, they're getting their butt kicked a bit or they're emotionally abused or maybe sexually abused. I mean, it, which is horrific. Um, horrific. But if you got a chance to be in front of five or 600 or maybe a thousand of those kids that are going through it right now, they're not through it, they're in it. What message would you say to them right now? The same message we when I, I build out orphanages and and I tell kids who are, you know, in that same position for I've been doing it for 30 years. Your environment does not define you. Your environment is your choice. And that environment is it's developed in your mind. You have an imagination. This is what I love about you, Kelly. You know, we're going away on the hideout. I'm super stoked to go with you. You guys get tickets. Because it's going to be fun, but you encourage imagination. And it's the what I can imagine I can become and what I accept I do become. Mm -hmm. So if you accept your circumstances, you are defined by them. If you can imagine yourself to be anything you want, you will become that because you redefine your environment. And it all starts with imagination. If you can imagine it. It will move through your thought process as if it's real and then it becomes real. You know, no one thought I remember when I called up my mom and I said I was dropping out of um, law school and I was going to go to become a beautician. And she was like, excuse me, she said, you, you better talk to your father. And my father's like, is there something you want to tell us, son? I was like, oh, I, I, I maybe we have a bad connection. Hold on, dad. I want to, I'm dropping out of school so that I can become a cosmetologist. Maybe I'll say it a different way. He's like, like a beauty person. I said, yeah, exactly. He's like, you're going to do hair. I said, yes. And he's like, do you want to tell us something? I didn't get what he was saying. You know, um, what was interesting, but then when I, you know, and I started making like deep six figure salary in the mid eighties after I got with a couple of really cool mentors, John McCormick was one of them, uh, Sam Bricado, Gino Stampora was probably one of my main mentors at that moment. And, you know, I said, well, you know, I can make $100,000 cutting hair, like keep, take home. I said, well, can I make two? And we're like, well, you can make anything you want. I said, what's the national average? 20 was the national average at the time. And I crushed it. And I, and I saw myself as that six figure earner before I even opened my salon and my friends who were still in law school couldn't believe that I was, you know, driving incredibly expensive cars, buying homes, building my own business, having, you know, 24 years old, I think you did the same thing at 24 years old. I, I had like 30 or 40 employees before I was 25 years old. Um, and we had a multi-million dollar salon in 19, 89 and 90. So, you know, I don't know what the math is, but there was a lot of money then. It's still a lot of money today. But um, you, but I had to imagine. It all happened in my head. No one believed I would do it. And I have so many stories where people see you imagining your environment to be that which you believe it should be instead of what you believe it can be. And there's a difference because what you believe it can be is based in your reality. What you believe it should be is based in your imagination. And when you can attach your reality to your imagination, magic happens. That's where the magic always happens. That's, so my advice to young people is do not let society define you in any aspect. 
do not accept society's pronouns for you, even if you think that they're giving you the choice. They're not. They want to put you in a box in order so for their lives to be more easier. And you don't have to live in that box. You can do anything you want and be anything you want. And no one is going to persecute you unless you allow it. And I don't mean allow it. I don't mean to de to defend yourself with with anything but the strength of your will and your mind and your heart. And that's what you need to prepare yourself. So that's what I would say to the young people. That's what I do say to young people. Just be it. Just be it. Imagine it every single day. Pray on it every single day. And then you all of a sudden your life changes. So, uh, Peter, my brother and I were talking yesterday, and he, he was talking about the fact that, say, like a, a Michael Jordan, um, who I arguably, I, I'm not even arguing this fact. He's the, he's the greatest to ever play the game. But he, he's ta he was talking about Michael Jordan. He said, do you think, Kel, that Michael Jordan needed someone to encourage them to get after it? Do you think that he needed somebody, every time he made a jump shot, to be, to be encouraging and what he was doing is he was helping me to realize that this journey of imagination is a lot of times lonely. And the iterations that you have, like, and I mean, in the 1980s, if you have a multi-million dollar salon, guys, that's like today having a 10 million, uh, $15 million place. And especially yeah. in an industry that was completely unheard of at that time doing what you were doing. So my hat's off. Talk to us too, because you have done this in every aspect of your life, whether it be in your marriage, whether it be in your family, whether it be in another business, when you moved into the marketing side, you just applied the exact same principles and you continue to succeed. Can you, can you talk to that a little bit and how you're able to stay in that confidence and who maybe lifts you up when, uh, when you know, during those times? Uh, yeah, I thought I hit upon it. I'll hit upon it again. I read books and and my faith in God, right? I mean, when you truly understand that you can, you're you never alone, you know? I mean, I remember we won in 1996. I got a phone call said, you guys are the number one salon in the country, Modern Salon Magazine. You won Modern Salon of the Year for 97. And it was a goal. And I said I would achieve that goal in 1989. And the year before, Donald's Trump Salon was one of the awards of special distinction as well. And he had a four-station salon that he put a million dollars into in the Taj Mahal, right? Now, the Taj Mahal, clearly, they were, but like four stations, a million dollars, tremendous amount of money. I'm like, how am I going to compete with these guys? Um, but I used my imagination, and I always knew, and I remember there was a, there was a company called Cara Belmont. And um, Bert and Naomi Littman owned it. Bert and Naomi Littman, and it was there was it was their headquarters, worldwide headquarters, were in Freeport, Long Island. And I went into the showroom in 1989, and I said, "And I'm looking at this case of trophies." And I would go there every day for weeks, and. That's where I got my inspiration, Kelly. I got my inspiration from looking at the accomplishments of others. And after two weeks of me writing in my little Moleskin book, right, because it's the 80s, I didn't have a phone, no one had that stuff. So I'm writing in the book every little detail of every little thing that I wanted. And they took me, you know, someone came out and said, can, can we talk to you in the back? You've been here every week for every day for two weeks. Are you working for one of our competitors? Like you've looked at every single thing. You've taken pictures of every single product, every single piece of furniture we have. And I said, no, I'm designing a salon. And one day it's going to be in, you know, I'm going to win a trophy and it's going to be salon of the year. And she looked at me, she says, you know whose salons are in there? Paul Mitchell, Vidal Sassoon, Horst Reckelbacher for Aveda, like all these big names. Who are you? And I said, oh, I'm Peter Anthony. How do you do? Right? It's like, you know, she said, you've got the biggest cojones I've ever, out of anybody I've ever met. She's like, you, you're, how old are you? And I said, um, um, at the time I was 23 or 24. I said, I'm 23 years old. I'm going to be 24. She said, well, 
are you going to buy anything? <laughs> right? It's like, I'm trying to figure out what I can afford. And, and, and here's the interesting part of that story, Kelly. Um, what happened, what transpired is I wrote a business plan. And that's when you had to type it out 40 page business plan for my for my salon. But all that was, was me engaging my imagination and finding out the details. This is what this is the advice. Find out the details that are necessary for your dreams to become a reality. If you're sitting up the top of the mountain holding hands with other people singing Kumbaya, having a big circle, whatever, that, that's never going to get you where you want to be. You need the details of your dreams and then you need to take action and apply it. So that's what I did. So anyway, she said, can you get a co-signer? And I was like, no, man, I went to, I, I literally went to about 10, 12 banks and they all threw me out. And I was like confused because I thought the American dream was if you had a plan, they'd lend you money. <laughs> not, not the dream, right? So I had to figure out, I always had to be creative. Mrs. Lippman, Bert's wife, signed my lease for my furniture personally. She said, we've owned this company for 30 years. We've never once signed personally for any salon. And she looked at me in the eyes. She said, I'm counting on you to do what you said. Mm. And if you go there now, um, my trophy sits in the case with everybody else's trophy. So it's, it was cool. Um, you know, and, and I remember when I won, it's, I, I was alone. And I went into my office and cried because I didn't have anybody at the time to share it with other than myself. And I was so exasperated from wanting it so bad. You know, it's like, you know, you, you want it and you, you just don't think it's going to happen. But then you have these mentors that aren't really engaged with you, meaning they're giving you tidbits. They know who you are in that moment, but you're not really completely connected to them like JP. I've met him five times, right? And, you know, they solicited me in 88, right? Um, when Jean Bra was at the top of her game. And, and, I, and, and I remember, and, I, and Jerry Casenza, I, I, you know, was all over me. And my picture hung in the wall of Sebastian, a six foot picture of me for 18 years. And my friend called me up when they closed the LA location. And he said, you know, they're taking down your picture. Do you want to come get it? And I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't even have any idea it was there. But these people will say one thing to you. And if you hang on that one thing, if you take a piece of Kelly Cardenas's wisdom and you apply, if Kelly says, hey, man, my pop said this and it's gold, that's, that's when you get the next level, man. That's what I think. So talk to us too. Uh, I mean, uh, Peter, many people get mentored right? So they read books, things like that. And then you have shifted that into not only you still stay a student of the game, but also you're taking people to a completely different level. You see things from a view. Your, your marketing eye is the best marketing eye I've ever seen in my life. And I've been around the best. I mean, and you're uh, one of the best. So. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, like when we had the, when we had the call, when we had the call the other day and it was just a, it was a friend call and you were like, Hey, just give me, let me just talk to this. And you blew my brains. I've got five pages of notes. You don't know this, but I got five pages of notes writing all the things that you were saying. And I was like, uh, I was very silent. And then you, I, I could tell that you were like, are you still there? And I was like, no, dude, I'm just <laughs> writing right now. Can you, can you, can you talk to the people out there, too, about some of the marketing missteps that you see that are so simple that, that doesn't cost a person a ton? Because I think a lot of times marketing for people, they, they get scared of it because they're like, well, I don't have the budget to be able to do it. But yours comes from a mind, like comes from truly a mindset. And once that shifts, I, I've already started to see shifts. I mean, Peter, I called you the other day and... I sold stuff that I didn't even have, like it wasn't even on the table. It wasn't even iteration, but because of your messaging was so strong, people made up stuff and asked me to do it. Can you, t can you talk to some of the things that you see, like where your mind, cause I want to go inside that brain. <laughs> You're great, man. I love you. Um, so 
here, uh, uh, so there's two things that are really key in marketing. There's understanding that no one cares about what you do or how you do it. What they always care about is how does what you do impact me, mm. right? The consumer, whatever it is, the other business, the B2B, it doesn't matter. When you understand that you're in your role, I was having this conversation the other day with somebody, your role is to serve at the highest level. My role um, as in, in my faith is to be the best example I could be daily for my father, right? My heavenly father. I just have to understand that I am in a servitude role. When we were doing hair, I understood I was in a servitude role and it hit me like a ton of bricks one day. I'll tell you that story another time, but it's an amazing story, an amazing story. But when you can make, you know, I have a super cool philosophy. Keep it simple, keep it fun, keep it memorable. Every piece of marketing. So any piece of marketing that you have, it has to be simple. Can people understand it easily? Is it fun? Will it make them smile? Will it make them feel something that they want? If it's simple and it's fun, they will remember it. So the third thing happens organically. Simple, fun, and memorable. When it hits all three of those things at high levels, it hit in the eight, nine, ten, right? They will have, and this is this is marketing. When the consumer has the confidence to share what you do, how you do it, and why you do it, and how much they love it, everything changes. But until you can get the consumer to fall in love with you, and in a in a way that they feel confident that they can explain to their friends, their family, and the naysayers what you do, how you do it, and why you do it, and how they love it, right? That's in anything. That's in your faith. That's in your salons. That's in your the law firm. It doesn't matter if you're selling soap or you're selling food. I don't care if you're selling pizza. If it's simple, fun, and easy to remember, people will share it, and you grow organically. That's the first place to start. Most people, um, to roll back around to the front of the question, most people complicate the message because they think the message is about their hero's journey and no one cares about your hero's journey. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. We're both successful men. You had an incredible father who impacted you. I was given up for adoption. Both wound up down the same path, had successful salons, built successful com companies, impacted tens of thousands of people. With, but we had different backgrounds, yet we wound up in the same place because of the decisions we made, but we both did one thing. I probably complicated it too much. But everybody who was always around you, man, I remember like we we're going to shows and I'm like, man, this kid is coming up. He's killing it. I better get out of this business because he's just going to bury everybody, right? And his whole posse was powerful, but not powerful like we're dressed up in Armani, you know, and we're from a, you know, from Matrix. I don't know if you remember those guys, right? And they were all like jacked up and like do, you know, and you guys came out and you were happy, man. You led with the energy of joy and people always remembered how you made them feel first. I don't know. How is your marketing making people feel? This is what I'm talking about, Peter. That's why I like, I was so excited when I got a chance to be able to have you on the show because I, and I said, I, I said, man, can you come on the show? And you, you said this to me and for everyone out there listening, this is what he said to me. He's like, I don't know what I would have to share. I don't know, but I'm saying you're dropping bombs, man. And <laughs> Talk, talk to us too about the the, the transition because you said something to me the other day and I didn't get a chance to um, thank you for it, but I want to thank you for it um, just between you and I. No one's listening right now. <laughs> but I wanted to thank you for it because you, you really encouraged me um, because when you go from an identity that you had, right, and mm -hmm. I, I, I've had in the professional beauty industry, yeah. you go from that identity and then you step into something which you stepped into that 
you weren't known the same way that you were known in the professional beauty industry. Trippy, Trippy man. And you stayed Peter all the way through, kept the principles. And when you, and if, for those of you go back and rewind this, or just, you could just go back to it and see where he said, when I was mentoring Les Brown, the, the largest in the personal development industry, their messaging comes from Peter Anthony. That part of it, right? The, okay, he's, he's, you're he's, humble. Right. You're humble. I, I, I'm not humble about my friend Peter. Um, I'm not humble about him at all. He's the best. And so help us to understand what that transition and, and what it was like for you emotionally too, because I don't think that people talk about those parts because they just see you like, wow, okay, now he's amazing in, in this other realm. But there was things behind the scene and emotions that you went through that a lot of times people don't get a chance to hear. That's humbling, man. And thank you for that. That's a cool question. It's, um, and, and many of us, right, right now, we're facing that, that transition, right? It's the transition from, I'm an expert, I have security, I have money, right? I mean, not many hairdressers make a million bucks a year. So, you know, we had, a, you know, $10 million salon, and I was making a lot of money. And, and when I transitioned out to just, just consulting, um, and, and everybody was telling man consult for the beauty industry consult for the beauty industry and i was like no man i really i i like this part of the job where i'm training people to share their message and i think i can transition it from sharing a message about doing cool hair and making people feel good to to actually sharing a message of how other how they can feel good in anything like hey man coming by you know like an accountant could be like you can just share something so cool about accounting right because you peel the onion back and you're like man if you only knew these five things about the tax code it would change the way you do everything what are the five things right <laughs> you're, you're intrigued me. right so you just like, did it man you it's amazing how you do it naturally keep going man so, so, but the, but the truth is, um, the transition is based on, again, I take it back to my faith. Um, you know, I was at the World Trade Center on 9-11, um, on that, the morning of 4.30 in the morning, I was sitting at the base, looking up at the Twin Towers, and I was talking to somebody, and I said to her, I said, man, there's got to be something more. I don't know what I feel, but something's shifting. I've got to get out there. So I had this traumatic experience where I lost five friends that morning. Um, and I don't know if you know the cats from Bumble and Bumble, but Dan Kaner and Michael Gordon lived right on Church Street. And I was with Dan that evening. And I called him up and I said, you got to get your family out right now. And his maid, um, house, you know, his, his nanny took the kids out. And literally a half hour later, his whole house and Michael's, their windows blew right out from one side of the building, right through the other into the yard. Every, literally everything in their home was destroyed. And like there was literally their kids, everybody would have been gone. And I remember that. And I thought to myself, man, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should be a pastor. Maybe I should follow my, my, maybe I'm being called to do something and share some sort of spiritual journey and you know so i sold my stuff and and i and i clearly am not cut out to be a pastor i you know <laughs> but i'm but i'm i i am good at sharing messages and the first message my my the book that i'm writing right now it's called an audience of one and the first person you have to convince is yourself you're speaking to yourself all the time you've got to You've got to make your internal message so cool and so fun and so vibrant and so sexy that you want to follow it. Because if you can't get yourself motivated, how are you going to motivate somebody else? If you can't get you, if you can't buy your own product, who's going to want to buy it for you? If you wouldn't spend ten thousand dollars to go out there and to do a seminar, or you wouldn't spend fifty thousand dollars to do a seminar, who are you to charge fifty thousand dollars? So you've got to be the consumer of your own product as you move forward through life. That's what I think, Kelly. I, th I think that most people aren't, they're not drinking their own Kool-Aid. 
and then they get stuck. That's that's what I think. And I want to honestly, like, you know, when you're talking about an audience of one, I mean, I I just want you to know how much it meant to me. Seriously, like the other day when we were talking and you were just you you were talking about the that transition, because, you know, for for myself, as I went through that transition and people were like, you're transitioning where are you going? You going to another planet? I said, no. (laughs) You but, do that? And you even asked me, I remember, and I don't know if this was a baited question, but you asked me when we first started uh, kind of really connecting and you were like, well, why aren't you doing this for the professional beauty industry? And I, I, I responded right away. I said, it's, I mean, it, it's not where I feel, yeah. it's not where I'm going. And mm-hmm. it was all, now I understand because you sat back and you said, hmm. And, you know, where where do you where do you continually get the ability to be able to pump everyone else up? Because I was in a room with you with sixteen guys in Salt Lake City. We were sitting around that mastermind table, and Peter didn't say anything about Peter. Peter was like, I mean, when you gave an introduction to someone, you were like, bam, bam, bam. They were they felt like they were on top of the world. <laughs> I'm sitting at a table with Kelly Cardenas. <laughs> But <laughs> how crazy is that? And people are like, Kelly, man, I worked for Paul Mitchell. You were my hero, man. You inspired me. And you're like, oh, cool. Right on. Right. It's like, <laughs> like, cool. Like, they, I mean, you, you, you know, like, and who knew, like, you know, the, the world is so small. You weren't expecting to see me. No, I didn't even know you were going to be in the room, Peter. And-, and I'm looking at him like, Sean, how did you meet Kelly? Like, Sean's one of my good friends. Right. And he's like, oh, this kid's cool. I saw him at a show, man. We got to be part of what he's doing. And I'm like, yeah, I've been telling you. Hello. <laughs> you know, I'm an early adopter. Can, can you talk to, uh, can you talk to this too, though, is you have done these three things that my parents taught me. And Pops taught me this all the time. Be super kind, like contribute to everyone. Right. 100. Make a ton of friends and then just stay really, really curious. Can you talk to the fact of how that really, I mean, it really gets you and opens doors because it's, I watch you, Peter, your, your education is amazing, but it doesn't open your doors. Your, your, your acumen phenomenal, but it doesn't open the doors. I just keep watching you and I get to watch from afar. And now I get to watch from a little bit closer, but every time a door is open to the Tony Robbins of the world, the Les Browns of the world, the Greg, Greg Reed's of the world. And you know, the Sean Finnegan's and the Jeff and all around, it's all because of who you are, not what you do. Can you help us to understand how to be able to start to construct that? Or, I mean, I know that it doesn't happen over a day either. I think it happens in an instant, mm. actually. An instant? In an instant like that i just think it happens like that man you know when you met your wife you knew you know when i when i saw my first child coming out of the womb and i had to cut alexis's umbilical cord nothing in an instant i made the decision that i will never leave her you know in an instant so i don't think you need to put a lot of work in what I think you need to do, and I, I think you speak on this, is I think I think you need to be all in, and that's a decision, and you lead with your heart. I am naturally curious about people, but what I am also is um, I love unconditionally. You know, I, I you know, um, you know, there there's a there, I my in my favorite book. When I'm reading, right, there's a, a, a hero in the book, right? And she's, this hero is going to be sentenced to death, right? And the person who accused him and put him and put him in this position comes in right before the night before. And, and the hero um, washes his feet and feeds him and loves him. Even though this is the guy who put him in this position. And, I'm, and I think about that story and I'm like, man, you know, that's unconditional love. That's walking the walk. You got to love unconditionally. People are people. Uh, you got to love them. Um, and, but you, and that also means inversely, you have to love yourself unconditionally because you're going to make mistakes. And I've made more mistakes than I make things right. 
But that's what gets me pumped up. I'm curious about people. I love them. I'm like, whoa, man, that's so. And then the first thing I do, I compliment people. I find something about them that I love. And there was this really famous hairdresser, and he taught me that. And I remember um, his name was Bruno Pettini. He worked for this group out of France called the Dessange Group. And he was the most prolific hairdresser, like the French Vidal Sassoon. He was just unbelievable. And I remember Bruno and I were having a conversation, and um, it was it was just a trippy moment. I had really long hair. I used to be cool like you, Kelly. You know, but not that, but I had really long hair. And You're I cool just, right now, man. It was beautiful. And I remember, so I'm like, I want to get my hair cut off, Bruno. He's like, why would you do that? And I was like, you know, and Bruno taught this cat, Frederick Fakai, and we kind of came up together and, and Bruno's gig. And, and um, so I'm like, I'm going to make an appointment with you. I'm going to, I, I, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to, I'm going to force you to do it. Right? I'm going to go down your book, man. So I make an appointment with him and he's so like frustrated, right? He's looking at me and I have my, my, my crucifix on that I had. And he looks at it and he says, this is, oh man, this is in the nineties. Right. So I've had this, I never take it off. Right. I've had it on for 30 years. He looks, this is, that's so beautiful. Right. And now here's the interesting part. So he, right, the first thing he does is he walks over and he gives me a compliment. And he had all his chairs set up in a circle, right? And he's looking at me, right? And next to me is this, is this, is an actor named Donald Sutherland. And Donald's looking at me and he's, he's like, you're really going to cut off all that hair. He's like, can I just have some of it, right? And he's like, and I'm like, you're freaking Donald Sutherland. I love you. Man. <laughs> you're making- you know, and I'm, I'm freaking out. <laughs> I'm freaking out. You know, my hair is going to get cut. And he did a terrible job. He cut it into a little page boy. I look like a complete moron. Right. And I was like, oh, man, he traumatized me. I had this long, beautiful hair. Right. But but here's the thing. I didn't know I was traumatized. He's running his hands through my But he was so kind. He was so kind. It didn't matter. He was so kind so kind and i and i and i watched him go in this circle and he was kind Mm -hmm. yeah he was the best hairdresser in my opinion he was one of the greatest artists in the world to ever live in in that industry and i look and it was so kind just kind he loved people he loved human beings and there was another woman who taught me that because i was living by that principle but you, you, you know, you, you need to find ways to get reminded, Kelly, because sometimes we all kind of dance to our own song and then we think that we're a product of our own, like I'm, you know, I'm the man, I'm, you know, like I'm not the man. So I'm, I'm in New Orleans with this woman who taught me how to do hair color and her name is Annie Humphreys. And, and if anybody has ever heard of Speed House, Annie Humphreys is like the, the woman, right? She was the, the best colorist probably of all time right? Super, super prolific. So we're at this restaurant and I'm sitting there with Annie and someone else, I think some, someone from Wella, because at the time I was the international creative director for Wella. And I'm sitting and we're, we're, um, we're hanging out. This is probably like 95, 90, yeah, probably 1995, 96. Right. So she's at the end of her career and I'm sort of, you know, at the precipice of mine, you know, like, my salons, I, you know, I had a few salons at the time. We're doing about, at that time, maybe six or seven million dollars a year. And um, I'm making bank and I'm thinking I'm cool, right? And, you know, m- and my haircuts were super expensive, you know, and my average ticket price in the 90s was like four or 500 bucks, you know, um, maybe more. And, you know, so I'm like, okay, cool. So Annie's talking and this waitress comes over, right? And she's a young girl college girl we're in new orleans and annie's like oh i love your hair right blonde hair no no nothing really nothing incredible but annie just loves on this woman and says listen i'm in the hotel why don't you come up to my room i'll color your hair i'll make it even better woman has no idea that this is the number one hair colorist on the planet like you could never get an appointment with her. And she just did this young woman's hair for free just because she because she had extra product. After she'd worked, we worked the show the whole 
last three days. That's where it was the dinner, as you know, being doing those events, you're exhausted, you know, and the dinner was like, okay, cool. We're just going to kind of unload with our contemporaries. And I was like, and it always stuck with me, you know, and I always said, man, as long as I can, as long as I'm breathing, I'll find the energy to help others. And, and whatever is supposed to happen in my life will happen. And, and I believe that. And I've always been respectful. I always call people Mr. and Mrs. Even if they're only a year older than me or a couple of years older than me, you know, because I, I, I respect what they've done and who they are. And I want to show that respect outwardly. So when you do that, when you lead in a respectful, unconditional, loving way, which I see you do daily, all you want to do is make people smile, right? All you're taught is make people smile. Everything will be fine as long as they're smiling, right? We, you know, Mrs. Smith, I just want to tell you, you're beautiful. There's a big hole in the back of your head, but it's okay because you're so beautiful, right? Yeah. Really? Yes, no problem. Right? We've got extensions to $900. <laughs> you want us to fix what we just screwed up, right? It doesn't matter. You make them laugh, but They'll always, you know, you can, you, as long, but if you become, if you hit somebody, it's, it's, it's simple physics. If you come at somebody aggressively, they're forced to respond aggressively unless they're trained to respond with love like Jesus does, you know? And, and I always think that, you know, like, who do I want to be like? I want to be the person who loves you unconditionally. I'm not always that person. You know, if a boy looks at my daughter, he doesn't always get Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's an opportunity to meet Jesus. Peter, tell, talk to us about that, too, because with kids, when you were talking about the respect part, I, I'm known in the neighborhood because I do not let any of the kids call me by my first name. This is a generational thing that has started to happen. And these kids, a lot of times, they'll roll up on any parent in the neighborhood and they'll be like, hey, by their first name. And they come yeah. to me and they know it's Mr. C. My, I, like, how do you <laughs> feel about this? And do you allow your kids' friends to call you Peter? It's, it's Mr. and Mrs. Wynn. Why is that right. so important? That's a, you know, it. It, it's it's certainly not an arrogance thing because no one calls me Mr. Wynn except my children's friends. But the reason is because you're coming into someone's home, you need to be respectful that you are now in a new place that is not yours. You have to carry that respect through. And it reminds you that this is their space. You know, this is you, you have to be respectful when you're a guest um, and, you know, and I know that you and I threw that word around a lot in the late 90s and <laughs> early 2000s, like you're a guest, right? How do you treat guests versus customers and clients and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I always knew um, that I was a guest in someone else's house. I was a guest in someone else's salon. And I always wanted people to know that I was, um, uh, you know, there to serve you know, and, and I'm arrogant as the day is long, you know, there's no doubt I'm, I'm, I'm pretty arrogant guy, but you, sometimes you wouldn't know it, you know, I'm, I'm, I love people. I just love them, Kelly. I just, I just think if you, everybody, you know, just tell them, tell some, you know, go grab somebody. You want to change your business right now? I'll give you, I'll give all your listeners a simple tip. Call 10 people. Right. Go through your phone. Call 10 people. Tell them, you know, I just wanted to reach out and tell you I love you. I miss you. How's everything going? Every, is everything cool? Is there anything I can do to serve you? Call 10 people a day. At the end of the month, that's 300 phone calls. I got 5,000 numbers in my phone. I could never call them all. But if you do that for 30 days, 30 days. I guarantee your life will change exponentially. I guarantee it. Don't send them a card. That's nice. Call them. Pick up the phone. It's free. You're paying for the you're paying for the service anyway. It's sitting in your pocket going unused. Mm. Call them. Not text. Call. Kelly, how are you, man? I just wanted to let you know, dude, I love you. You're amazing. Like you and I send each other just inspirational texts all the time. 
And then all of a sudden my phone will ring. He's like, dude, I don't want to text you. I'm like, it's Kelly Cardenas. <laughs> Everybody stop. Stop the Zoom. Kelly's on the phone. I'll talk to you. Leave meeting. <laughs> so I, I think it's it, it really it shocks people. Peter, what's the wonder, uh, the the number one thing, like, because uh, you're coaching people and you're, you're doing stuff and, um, but what's the number one way that you make sure that your wife is filled up besides the fact of being on time? That's an awful <laughs> question. Come on. I I'll have, to and I'm going to have you, I, I tell you this, Peter. The number one day well, that and you I, do fill up your wife. No, no. The f- number one thing you do, and, and what I am going to tell you is, is Peter's time is so valuable and his wife probably just walked in the room. And she probably yeah, said, Peter, you got another appointment coming. But what I want you to know is we're going we're gonna to honor that. But how do you honor your wife? Because a lot of times people in your position that are coaching other people and helping them to grow, a lot of times the people who are closest to them are the people that don't get that as much. But you seem to do it on all levels. So what is the, what's the secret here, man? How do you fill your wife up? I don't know if there's a secret, so, but I will tell you, that I do two things. If you ever, if you go to any of the masterminds that I, I, I speak at and, the, and I'm with the people, they'll always say, Peter Anthony's just, you know, he always is just talking about his wife, how smart she is. And, you know, she's an advocate for ch- children's advocate for children with special needs in the IEP community. She's the number one advocate in the country, the country. She's got a two year waiting list. She's a stud. You know, if your child has something going on, you know, um, my wife is their champion, you know, and she's, there's nobody better. There's nobody better. She never lost a case. Doesn't mean she won't, but until now, thousands of cases, never lost one. Every child gets what they need. She's a tiger, man. And, um, you know, for all the guys out there, Louis Vuitton helps fill up any woman's Right, just go, go to Louis Vuitton. <laughs> it's a Paris, you know, help a BMW or Mercedes. That's not a bad start. <laughs> and and I, I'm, I'm lat, but but it's the, it goes back to the five love languages, Kelly. You got to figure yeah. out which one of and and you've got to take the time. So time, um, understanding which love language do, do the people around you, not just your wife, but to the people, your children. You want to fill up your wife, send her to a spa, take the children for the day. Mm. That, you know, because she never gets downtime. You know, she, my wife works, then she cleans, cooks, right? I help, you know, and we have, we have help. We're wealthy people, you know, but still you've got to, you know, like, I don't, we don't have people following us around, you know, like you still got stuff to do, you know, you have a big, you know, but you know, that time that, that I think some people really appreciate time. Other people appreciate dinner. Other people appreciate your participation in what they believe is their challenge. And it's never their challenge. So that's sometimes why you don't participate because what you believe about what they're going through, you don't believe that that, but you got to step back and say, well, what's, what are, what would mean something to them, to them? It's the same thing. When I believe what you believe when I believe that you believe what I believe, we're connected. Now you want to stay connected. You have to make people not only believe that you believe what they believe, but they need to experience. They don't need to think it. Now you need to next level, help them experience what they believe. So if they believe that they're, they, they want more help, offer them some help. You know, if they believe they want a piece of Louis Vuitton, go figure out how to get it. You know, it, it, I mean, it, it's it's really that simple. It was funny. Tony Robbins had a this thirty thousand dollar class for couples, right? Where bring couples out to Fiji with him and Sage. And I was like, he's like, oh, you should come. I said, Tony, I'm going to spend thirty thousand dollars plus airline tickets plus hotel, blah 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 blah. It's fifty grand. I said I can make my wife happy for twenty five, and she'll never forget it. Fly to Paris, we go have lunch, fly her back to Ireland, come back, stop at a couple of stores. She needs a pair of shoes, a nice handbag, and a sexy skirt. She'll she'll be uh, forget it. My my life will be good for two or three years. <laughs> you know, and I get something out of it. Like I don't, don't want to fly to Fiji. Talk about like how to listen more. I already know how to listen. I just don't do it. 
You already know how to listen to people. Listen to them. You know? Like, I mean, like, really listen. You see what's going on, right? Say, first week of school. I'm taking my kids to school. My wife's picking them up. We're connected. She's adjusting her schedule. I'm adjusting mine. We're at each other, right? Both, uh, right? But, you know, I'll go buy her a massage. You just cost me money, Kelly. I got to go buy her a massage and a facial. Thank you. Actually, I mean, I've got to do that right now, too. I'm going to do that today when I get off the when I get off the call. So, uh, Well, Brooklyn's worth it. Brooklyn is. I mean, she's she's gangster, man. I mean, anyway. At, on a next right. level. And she might, I, I'm, I'm trying to work on it because Jeff asked me about, uh, is she coming to Zenith with me? She's coming. I told and, Jeff she is. Okay. So I talked to her and her day freed up. So we just got to get some, uh, some, someone to come out and watch the kids and, and no, gonna, take we might do that too. So well, well, because my kids will be there. Yeah. Steel's kids will be there. There'll be okay. kids there. Yeah, I tell you, cool. Hey, I know time is of the essence Ben, your time is super valuable. I'm going to ask you in front of everyone, like my kids would do to me in front of the other kids' parents. Daddy, can I, Daddy, can I stay the night? And they would do it in front of the other parents, so I would have to say yes because. But I'm going to ask you in front of all these people who are listening right now, I need to have you on the show more often because you drop bombs, you're real, and what I love about it is when I started the podcast, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't about what people did, but it was who they are. And hey man. it's, right. it's the most, it's the most important thing to me. So, you know, this, um, everyone out there listening, the uh, Wayne Freeman, I want to give a shout out to you. Thank you so much for listening and riding with us from the beginning. Tony Torres. Thank you so much. Uh, Melissa, you know who you are. Hilda. Thank you so much. But I started the podcast because of my kids. Maddox right and McKenna. And I did it because I wanted to take iconic people like yourself and I wanted to show my kids that you're not a superhero, that you're a human being with a phenomenal attitude and crazy work ethic. What advice that's would you have? My, that's the same thing, man. I did the same thing on YouTube. I did 70 videos wow. this year for my kids because I, and I'll do another probably 70 before the year ends just so my kids have content of me. You know, just little one minute piece of, of advice yeah. for business owners, because you forget what you you forget what you know. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense, but you do. You forget what you know. What advice would you give to Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both of their names, it would be amazing. Well, first of all, Maddox and McKenna have the coolest dad and mom on the planet. So there's not much advice I can give them other than just, you know, um, because you have such a cool, such cool parents, things are going to be easier. Find ways to challenge yourself because your, your life w is not based on what you do, but based on who you become and who you become happens in moments of adversity, not always in the easy stuff. And you know, that that's just become something epic because you challenged yourself and allowed yourself to become uncomfortable so that you can find character. That's what I would say. And Maddox and McKenna, man, we're going to have so much fun when you guys come out to Utah. Just going to snowmobile and snowboarding. Just fun, right? Well, Peter, you have been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I want to thank all our sponsors. Uh, you guys know, if you're listening, click the links. Do all the things that you know you need to do. Um, check out Peter and Anthony. Oh, the hideout. I mean, I tell you, the hideout, uh, do me the favor. You already told one out. Yeah, do me the favor, Peter. What's the favor? Tell them quickly in that, that, that simple, fun, and memorable. Tell them about the hideout. Well, first, here, here's what I love about Kelly. Anybody who hangs around Kelly naturally feels happy and grateful. The hideout is going to be an opportunity where Kelly can share with you not only who he is, but how you can find that joy inside your life in every moment by just becoming a kid, by right? being playful and adding playfulness to every component of your life, to your family, to your faith, to your fun, to, you know, to your finances, right? Those little things that have allowed Kelly Cardenas to be the number one person in his space and becoming one of the top people in his new space is because he makes things fun. What you're going to do is you're going to have fun for two days. And during that, 
you become open, right? Because your, your energy opens up and he's bringing in really amazing people to speak with you, to talk and walk with you during those two days. What you're going to absorb is going to be life-changing. If you don't get to the hideout, it's a big mistake. I told Kelly it was a big mistake for him to charge so little. This is fact. I told him he should be charging seven, eight thousand dollars for two days, um, especially if there's only twelve people. Right? It makes no sense. How much is it, Kelly? It's like I don't even want to. Like, it's thirty three hundred. Thirty three hundred. Three okay, thirty so. three hundred twenty dollars and eleven cents. Thirty three hundred twenty dollars. <laughs> it's retarded. Because it's fun. That's why. That's it's a- fun. If you don't get there. Right. It's in, and it's in hideout, right? It's in hideout, Utah. Oh yeah. So it's in Utah. So if you're on the West coast, you can drive there. It's an incredible drive. I will absolutely be there for one of the days. So I'm excited about that. I mean, spending time with you, like all the people out there listening, if you're thinking about the hideout, (laughs) you actually get to spend a time with this genius, not in a keynote, but getting chance a chance to be able to play pool with him, hang out, and ask nice. real questions in a crowd of twelve, it's in a crowd of unbelievable. 12. So yeah, it's going to be unbelievable. So we're really excited. I need to see you there. Yeah. Um, you know, so just go out and make it happen. And just Kelly, take this, clip it out. You know, edit it up. Right. If you're not going to the hideout, it makes no sense. You want to take your business to the next level. You have to invest in creating new. Um, influence around you that wants you to be at that next level versus the influence around you that wants to keep you where you are. So get there, man, do it. What are you waiting for? It's cheap. Peter, you're, you're incredible, man. Well, uh, like I said, ch- check the sponsors, do all the things that you know you need to do as a listener. And we want to thank you. Thank you for uh, helping us to be in the top 1% globally as far as all podcasts. We're excited right now too, Peter, because we are live on Facebook right now. We are live on LinkedIn and we are live on YouTube, which we will continue to be. And we want to thank all of you. Peter, you have been a phenomenal. You are the man. You have exceeded expectations and you are officially off the hot seat.